OK, everyone, uh, today's lecture is about quantum computation. Comes at a bit of a funny time in the course. It seems a little early, but we had been talking about uh, models of computation, so that makes some sense. And as we'll see, it's closely connected to uh, Fourier transforms, which we've also been talking about. So uh, let me set the stage for you. Back in the 70s, people were really excited. They had a great idea for making computers better. They had the idea of, like, let's add uh, probabilism, randomness, to computation. Uh, you know, just the ability to take regular old uh, computer program and add like coin flip as an instruction or random bits as an instruction. And surprisingly, this leads, this idea led to uh, faster algorithms than previously known for some basic uh, fundamental tasks, assuming you allow for a small probability of error, which you must when you're talking about randomized computation. So let me give you some examples. Uh, here's a basic task. You know, you're given an n bit number, and you want to know if it's a prime number or not. We talked about this a little bit uh, before in an earlier lecture. The best known deterministic algorithm for this problem, well, no deterministic efficient algorithm make, uh, was known until 2002. Uh, but since then, the, the best one known takes something like n to the six steps, which is quite terrible. But the fastest known probabilistic algorithm is much better. It takes only quadratic time, probabilistic. So that's pretty great. And in practice, people only use the probabilistic algorithm. Just one more funny example. If you want to compute the minimum spanning tree, uh, all right over here. If you want to compute the minimum spanning tree in an n-vertex graph, uh, the fastest known probabilistic algorithm is linear time. And it's not known whether there is a linear time deterministic algorithm. The fastest known algorithm is or n times alpha n, where alpha is the inverse Ackermann function, some very slow growing function. Uh, so very exciting, great. I mean, fantastic. We can, uh, in practice, you know, speed up certain computational problems by using randomness. Uh, now, you can ask, how exciting can this possibly get? And I'll tell you what is known, or sorry, I'll tell you what's believed about the um, ability of probabilistic computation to speed up uh, over, over deterministic computation. So one belief. And all of these beliefs are backed up by um, well-understood complexity theory assumptions. Uh, belief number one is that randomness uh, speeds up kind of basic you know, computer function type tasks, like these ones, by at most a polynomial amount. So it may be the case that there are some problems that, you know, we don't, it's not like we know like lower bounds for any of these problems, but it might be that, you know, primality cannot be determined in, I don't know, cubic time, for example, with a deterministic algorithm, but it can be with a quadratic time. That uh, seems possible, and in practice, we know situations similar to that. Uh, and there's some complexity theory evidence, however, that you'll never get like some uh, dramatic speed up that's bigger than a polynomial gap. OK, so roughly speaking, this is known to be true if, for example, uh, SAT requires circuits of size 2 to the omega n, which is pretty believable, then uh, this becomes uh, true. That's a theorem of um, uh, uh, Impagliazzo, Wigderson, and others. Um, another belief that's kind of about the negative, uh, uh, sort of negative uh, statement about the power of randomized computation to do amazing things is speaking of SAT, you know, we believe that the SAT problem is extremely hard and seems to require time basically 2 to the n for uh, any algorithm. And it's generally believed that like, you know, randomness does not help with this, especially that if I allow you to have a randomized algorithm for SAT, it's still going to take you like 2 to the n time. So another belief is that, let's say, the SAT problem cannot be solved in like order 1.999 to the n time, even with a probabilistic algorithm. OK, so there are many problems where we know where uh, randomness seems to afford a pretty good speed up over what we know deterministically. But generally, we believe it's not like some amazing superpower that's going to give exponential speed ups for problems. <coughs> OK, so I bring this up because it's a great analogy to quantum computing. So then, like 20 years later in the 90s, some other people had like a similar idea. They're like, let's take regular old 
computation, probabilistic computation, and add uh, quantum particles to it. Now, the laws of quantum mechanics have been like, well known for like, I guess, close to 100 years now. And one thing that's uh, well known and surprising about them is that if uh, nature wants to keep track of the quote unquote state of n particles, like photons or electrons or something, uh, it requires her to do calculations on 2 to the n numbers. And so that's kind of surprising. Uh, people had the idea if you could somehow like hack into this amazing computational power of nature, as Umesh Fazrani likes to say, then perhaps you could do, use it to do something like exponentially awesome. If you could just get uh, these particles to do some kind of computation through the transformation of their state. And uh, people thought about it and defined a model of uh, quantum computing, which uh, in principle is realizable in practice, although you know the engineers are still working on it. But uh, here's some things analogous uh, to these speedups that we know. There's two very famous ones. First of all, there's a factoring algorithm by Shor from 94. So on a, he showed that uh, on a quantum computer, you could factor in basically uh, n squared time. This is for factoring n bit integers. OK, and compare this with the best known classical algorithm. By the way, throughout, the adjective classical means not quantum. So the best known classical algorithm uh, seems to take 2 to the n to the 1 third time. Actually, this is only conjectural. The best known proven bound is like 2 to the o tilde of root n time. But OK, it's, it's pretty much believed it takes this time, which is exponential time. But the quantum algorithm speeds it up to quadratic time, which is amazing. OK, so once uh, Shor discovered this, everybody seemed to, they had to sit up and take notice about quantum computing. And uh, there's one other famous uh, quantum algorithm, which is called Grover's search algorithm. Uh, and it's from uh, 96. And uh, it's not normally stated this way, but I think the best way to state it or to think about it is that he showed that the SAT problem from over there is in time uh, o tilde of square 2 to the n time. OK, so you can solve it in something like 1.4 or 1 to the power of n time, which is you know, only a polynomial speed up over 2 to the n time in some sense. You know, this is about the square root of this. But it's still kind of amazing to solve SAT, which naively seems like it should take 2 to the n time in uh, this much, much smaller amount of time, 1.4 to the n, or square root 2 to the n time. Uh, so that's pretty great. Now, a little bit sadly, like unlike um, randomized computation, where we actually know, like, you know dozens of examples of like, using randomness to speed up basic computational problems where randomness doesn't seem to be involved, I think it's still fair to say in quantum computation, after 25 years, we just know like two problems, like these two where quantum computers have some kind of amazing speed up. But still, that's pretty good, right? I mean, these are still pretty awesome. I mean, SAT, uh, you know, the most famous problem in computational complexity and factoring, like the basis for most of cryptography, uh, these are pretty important problems. So today, I'm going to try to give you the super fast introduction to quantum computation and tell you how uh, this one works, Grover Search. Uh, OK. So what is the main way in which quantum computers uh, get an advantage over classical computers? I will tell you, try to tell you in one high-level shot, and maybe it won't make perfect sense, and then I'll like, back up the truck and explain uh, quantum computing a little bit more thoroughly. So this is the main power that quantum computers have, or n, capital N being to the little n. Uh, the quantum computer, if it gets like n physical, like, you know, subatomic particles together and can control them and manipulate them uh, appropriately according to the well established laws of quantum mechanics, then it can do the following. So uh, it can essentially 
get some kind of access to the Fourier transform of uh, capital N data points, as long as those data points are implicitly representable. That was a complicated statement, so let me try to say more. Imagine you had some Boolean function, such as we were talking about uh, yesterday, or last time. Uh, so a Boolean function, when you think about it as a truth table, is like a, just a list of capital N, in this case, uh, numbers. And think of this as like a data vector, if you will. And the point is that um, this function that maps the, the you know, index into this like array into the actual value should be efficiently computable. OK, and uh, these the numbers in this, this uh, data vector can be complex numbers, if you like. Uh, so this should be efficiently computable by a classical algorithm. So this is what I mean where you have like an exponential amount of data, but somehow it's implicitly represented by like a, a classical object. Okay, think of it like a circuit or a little, I don't know, algorithm that computes f. Now imagine, oh, and so what, what, uh, what goes on here is that if f is efficiently computable like this, then in principle you can efficiently uh, basically coax n particles, like n photons, to have a state which is equivalent to this vector. Again, I'll explain this a bit more later, but that's sort of the setup. <coughs> and then what a quantum computer can do by you know, running those particles through some fixed obstacle course cleverly designed of, I don't know, lasers and uh, mirrors and so forth. It can transform the data according to a Fourier transform, either the DFT matrix from two lectures ago or the, this is sort of the Fourier transform for um, functions on numbers one through n or the Fourier transform for Boolean functions, the Hadamard matrix we talked about last time. And this will actually correspond to some polynomial in little n size physical apparatus. And OK, when you do this, you'll get out some vector, which sometimes you think of as the coefficients of a polynomial, which represents this data if it's a Boolean valued function, or the coefficients. Uh, when this data is interpolated over the, the roots of unity. OK, and uh, in quantum computing, you sort of uh, set up your particles in this state. Then your quantum computer does this Fourier transform. Now, unfortunately, you don't just get to look at this outcome. I mean, this outcome does not like, exist anywhere in nature, because it's a vector of length 2 to the little n. And you know, it's maybe a thousand, so that's way too huge to exist in nature. But what happens is that the algorithm can receive a string S with probability proportional to uh, this entry squared. OK, so for example, if there happens to be one coefficient in here which is really big, then the algorithm will uh, learn which coefficient is really big with high probability. OK, so somehow, and we'll get into this in a bit more detail, this is the power, this is like the unique power of quantum computers. If you have some like implicitly representable data, you can efficiently, with like a quantum apparatus, Nature will like take its Fourier transform, and then you don't get to see the result, but you can uh, sort of sample in some way from the result. So this is like a weird power, but it's going to be enough to do these two things. <laughs>